Good afternoon, folks. How you doing? Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a little bit about the University of Central Florida. Um, I was in a presentation earlier, and um, uh, somebody noted that they had uh, about 25,000 students, and they were a big school. So we've got about 60,000 students, so that makes us a honking big school. Um, I will mention the classes started in October of uh, 1968, and that's important to me because my grandfather was one of the original staff uh, that worked there. He worked in logistics, shipping, and receiving, and he worked in the uh, uh, loading dock of the library, and I work in the basement of the library right around the corner from the loading dock. So for me, that feels like a pretty good place to work. Uh, a little bit about me. Yes, that's really my email address. Uh, those are my initials. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, I was UCF's first LMS administrator back in 98. Uh, uh, worked for WebCT for a year. And I think there's two kinds of programmers. I think there's the really creative programmers that put a web camera in a car and figure out how to make it drive autonomously and not run into things, and they do really cool things. I'm not that kind of programmer. I'm lazy. I don't like doing repetitive tasks. So my programming is a desire uh, for me to go and do other things and, and let the computer take care of uh, dull, boring, and repetitive tasks. Um, I wrote this presentation. I know the material. The material is kind of boring. I apologize for that. It's the nature of the beast. Um, so I will try and throw some jokes in there. Uh, please laugh. If you're not laughing at the jokes, feel free to laugh at me. I can't tell the difference. I was refreshing some of my technical skills, and I had a uh, networking instructor say, I can build one of the best networks in the world until people want to start using it. And boy, isn't that the truth. We can build wonderful systems, and, and we figure out the use case, and we know that's the way it's going to be, and then we release it to faculty. And, they want to do different things with it, and it kind of breaks things. But that leads us to the real title of this talk. Do we really have to add users? Yeah, we do. And there's no sense in doing it in a long, drawn-out way. Um, and uh, this is my, my, my only slide that um, mentions the hero theme. So this is, this is my. Yes, yes, that's right. This is my, I, I tried. God darn it, I tried. Um, I've, I, this is something you won't hear anywhere else. Um, I call it the provisioning triad. Um, which course is being taught by which instructor to which set of students? That, that's pretty much your bare, bare bones set of information you need to do any kind of provisioning. Okay. Now, obviously, if you have more information than that, the more successful your, your provisioning setup is going to be. Your SIS information system is going to have the information for the triad. Um, that's where the colleges create the classes and build the sections. They assign the structures. And that's where the students enroll for the classes. So right there, you've got the um, information for what I call the triad. Um, and you will notice inherent in that are users. So there's really four things there, but a quartet is not nearly as cool as a triad. Right? That's one of those jokes you're free to laugh at <laughs> or laugh at me for. There you go. Uh, typically, your SIS information system is going to have uh, more information than just the triad. It's going to have start and stop dates, uh, your terms, potentially your cross listing, um, other types of roles. But most, most importantly, it's going to contain the changes in, in information. New sections that are created, uh, enrollments as users add and drop through the system as they withdraw uh, from courses. Well, that's great. You've got the information in the SIS. How do you get it to the learning management system? Uh, typically, there's three ways you can do that. You can do that manually. 
And like I said, I'm lazy, so we don't do a lot of that. You can do it in batches, or you can do it transactionally. Um, I don't know anyone that does anything purely one way or the other. Uh, it's usually some kind of combination of the, uh, of the three of those. Um, manually, you can have anything from a complete free-for-all, allow users to create their own accounts, allow users to create classes, enroll themselves in classes, enroll anyone else in classes. Um, but that's a mess. That's, that's just, I mean, I'm not much of a control freak, but boy, that's kind of ugly. Um, you could have it done manually by trying to have a, uh, some sort of administrator match up the uh, information in the LMS to the SIS, but that's cumbersome, and like I said, I'm lazy, so rather than do that, well, I'm sorry, pros and cons. Um, certainly, if you're doing it manually, you don't have to do anything. Um, one thing that is nice about having a manual approach, you can allow uh, sub-account administrators to handle uh, some of the administration for you. You can offload that into um, uh, to other people. And more, most importantly, I think, it allows you flexibility. Not every business rule is going to be accounted for in your SIS. You're going to have to add a student into a class. You're going to have to add a visiting instructor as an instructor into a course. Um, and there's just, your SIS typically doesn't account for those types of things. Um, the downside of having an absolutely manual process, if it's not in the SIS, if, if students are, are taking a course that's, that's not, that they haven't registered for in the SIS, that means they haven't paid for it, right? And that's just bad, because that's where we, we get our salaries from, that's how Canvas makes their money, and uh, well, anyhow, and, and, and lastly, it's not scalable. You just really can't do that for very long for very many uh, users. Batches. You're talking about handing chunks of information uh, to the SIS information system, or from the SIS to the LMS. Um, we do uh, 249,000 users um, overnight on a 24-hour basis. Um, so you, you know, anywhere between a quarter of a million files to a uh, quarter of a million records to a, a single uh, record. And you can do that two ways. You can do that manually through the GUI if you have to, or you can do it programmatically through the API. Um, and CSV files allow for snapshots and incrementals, a snapshot being a complete uh, dump of the information in your uh, SIS, and incrementals being the change in information since the last time you uploaded information. Typically what we do is we run incrementals throughout the day several times a day and then we do a snapshot overnight to catch anything that might have been missed uh, during the incremental process. And that works really well for us. Uh, the CSV format is dead simple. Um, because it's simple, it's easy to export the data out of the SIS into a CSV file. You run it multiple times a day, um, so it's fairly responsive. Um, and again, if you don't have a programmer to, to write the um, code around an API call to do it, you can do it manually. There's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you gotta do to get the job done, well by golly, then do it. And it's not hard to do that two or three times a day through the add drop process and then things uh, settle down and reach a steady state. Um, in my opinion, it's the best return on investment is, is doing batches. Manually is, is just crazy to try and do, and transactional is uh, very difficult to program. Um, one of the downsides is that the CSV files, they're queued in the order in which they're received by, the, uh, by Canvas. So we run that 250,000 students, we run that overnight when there's no other jobs waiting to be processed. And that takes about three hours to process. Um, so we just know that once that job starts running, 
there's going to be no SIS imports for the next three hours or so. Um, it is very difficult to catch the errors that happen when you're uploading information through the SIS because you're uploading a batch of information. If you're doing it transactionally, you're submitting one record at a time and you immediately get back the results, success or failure with an error message of that um, transaction. Uh, transactions are typically uh, triggered by a change in the SIS. Somebody adds a course, so it fires off an API call to Canvas. Uh, could be a name change, somebody changes their name, somebody changes their uh, user ID, their email address, a new user is created, and then those are all typically um, very small pieces of information that you're sending one off uh, to the learning management system. Um, the pros, I, I think students want, uh, students expect that when they register for a class in the SIS, that they should be able to log into Canvas and see it. And that's not necessarily what you're going to get with batches. So um, if your students are looking for that sort of immediacy, you know, they're the Twitter generation. If it's not 140 characters or less, um, it doesn't do them any good. And they want it 140 characters 10 times in three minutes. They don't want it um, any longer than that. Um, and like I said, if you do have large files, um, or excuse me, if you have large numbers of records, uh, technically you're limited to 3,000 uh, API calls per hour. Um, we regularly go over that, but uh, it's in your contract uh, to 3,000 per hour. And it's much more difficult to program. You have to catch every error as it happens. And um, with incrementals and snapshots, you have the chance to fix any errors in the incrementals in the snapshot. Whereas with a transactional process, you're throwing one record at it, you have to check for a failure, and if it fails, you have to do something with that. You don't get a chance to fix it. Yes, sir? Can you repeat that 3,000 per hour limit? It's a uh, uh, limit in your contract, depending on how well you read the contract you signed. It's in, well, let me rephrase that. It's a limit in our contract. I, I certainly haven't seen anyone else's contract. Um, and, you're, and I think that's boilerplate language for them. I, don't quote me on that, please. But um, like I said, we, have, we regularly go over that. I upload Scantron files, and um, it's one score per API call. And I know I throw more than 3,000 an hour at that. But I will tell you, they do watch that, because we were trying to do some um, uh, data mining, and we um, we forked a process that was making API calls. And I don't know how many times we forked it. But I got a call. Is Taylor here? Is Taylor still in the room? Taylor called me. And he told me that one of our tokens had been suspended. And um, because it was, um, we were impacting performance on that shard. Yes, sir? Correct, yeah, it's, it's the sum total. Like we do Scantron uploads, we do uh, some provisioning. Um, any of your LTIs that might use um, have a, 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 a API integration with it. Yeah, all those in total. Yeah. Yes, sir? Correct, yeah, it's the number of API calls, regardless of how they're being made or by whom they're being made. Well, that's, the nice, that's one of the nice things about um, what we do with the batch calls. It's, you're uploading a single file, so it's a single API call, but we're uploading 250,000 user records. So it's a single API call that takes you know, 20, 30 seconds to upload the file, and then Canvas chews on that file for two or three hours, but it's only a single API call. Someone else? I'm sorry, I've just had 10 questions in a row and I, I blew that, but I'll try and be better about that, I promise. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, doing an implementation for provisioning. We're going to talk about planning, SIS IDs, 
uh, CSV files, batches, transactions, um, pagination if you haven't heard about that, and then I'll talk about um, the actual API calls themselves. Time spent planning is never wasted. And certainly at some point, you have to fish or cut bait and you actually have to start writing code. But take your time, plan it, get to know your data. Um, at UCF, all courses have four digit section numbers, all of them, except for one. <laughs> it's a math class taught at a community college by UCF instructors and it has five digits in its section number. And it's the only one out there, but it's something I found out when I was going through a provisioning process. Basically because it broke my code, not because I was doing my pre-planning like I should have. Which ones can you ignore? Um, what, what quirks in the data can you ignore? Which ones? You're probably not going to be able to ignore many of them, to be honest with you, because they'll, they'll, they'll come back and they'll find their way into, their, into the LMS eventually. Um, get to know your data source. Where's the data coming from? Is it uh, out of an Oracle database, uh, SQL? Is it, are you the one getting the information? Do you have to work through a programming team and make requests for specific files? How often can those files be provided? Um, how cranky are the programmers that have to write the queries to generate those files? How happy do you keep, got to keep those people? Um, is it somebody that doesn't mind doing it over and over again until they get it right, or is it somebody that wants to do it once and be done with it? What do your users expect? Your students are going to want to sign up for the course in SIS, and they're going to want to get into that course immediately. And, and if they can't, they're going to give you a call and try and find out what went wrong. Well, nothing went wrong. The batch hasn't run yet. It only runs once every two hours. What? Two hours? That's crazy. Um, instructors want it correctly. They want the, the roster in Canvas to match the roster in the SIS system. The registrars, they want it officially. They don't want students taking classes for free. They only want paying students in there. Um, and us, we just want it done conveniently. Like I said, I'm lazy. SIS IDs, you guys are familiar with that? That's the, um, I, basically your identifier. That's going to be a, the link between uh, your SIS system and your learning management system. Uh, lots of things have, uh, have IDs. Um, ours are pretty basic. Uh, a user SID looks like that. That's mine. Um, back when I was going to school, that would have been my social security number. That was a joke. But it's not a joke anymore. Uh, yeah, it does. Back when I, I was happy to get dirt because it was hard walking on, on rocks, let me tell you. Um, this is what our course SIS ID looks like. Uh, it contains our, our uh, term code, uh, the database it comes from. The course is GEO 1200 and it's section 0001. And the way we provision things, um, every section has a course. So we create a course and then we tie a section to it. If that gets cross-listed, if that section gets cross-listed and pulled away from that course, we don't mind having that, that course sitting out there empty um, because eventually what will happen is somebody will tell us, no, no, I'm not team teaching anymore. I really don't want those courses uh, cross-listed with this other instructor. And we'll, when we uncross-list them, we've got a place to put them when we decross-list them. And again, it, it's kind of weird that our, our, our sections and our courses have the same SIS ID, um, but surprisingly it works really well. Um, in theory, CSV files are standard. They're all the same. Uh, in practice, they're very different. Um, so I'm not going to tell you guys how to write a CSV file. I'm, I'm assuming everyone here is at least as smart as I am. Uh, I think it's a reasonable assumption because I know myself. Um, but uh, take a look at the docs. They'll tell you how to write them. Um, these are things that can be added to Canvas uh, using SIS files. Uh, and they kind of have to be created. Um, it's going to be a separate uh, CSV file for each one of those. 
And they kind of have to be created in that order. Um, you have to have users and sub-accounts. Um, groups belong to sub-accounts, so the sub-accounts have to be uh, existent. Uh, group memberships have to belong to groups. Um, courses belong to terms, and they belong to sub-accounts. So everything kind of builds on itself. You, further, further down, the more you have sections belong to courses, enrollments uh, going to sections or courses. Cross-listing depends on, on sections, so you have to build things out in a certain order. Good yes, question. sir. Will Canvas pull those in in the right order if they're all in one zip file? I believe it does, yeah. I believe it does the right way. And I, yeah, I just, I, yeah, I upload them one at a time, and I, I just do them in the right order. Yeah. Um, pagination, I'm going to skip that because we're at 10 minutes. I upload a single CSV file at a time. Um, it's almost like a transactional thing. I can see if there's any errors in that one file. So I know to run that one file again versus uploading a batch and trying to figure out what went wrong with one of five or six files. Um, this is what it looks like to uh, uh, upload a, a file, a CSV file in there. That's what an actual post uh, command looks like if you've never seen it before. This is the response you get. Uh, I'm most interested in the ID so that I can track that and follow up on it and make sure it gets um, finished. You'll notice progress is at zero. That's zero percent. Um, there's a batch mode parameter. Don't use it unless you know what you're doing. Really just don't use it. Um, it overwrites everything, so any manual changes you've made get overwritten, and most people don't want to do that. Um, stickiness in Canvas. Um, not everything in Canvas is, is sticky. Uh, only certain fields are sticky. And this is one of those slides that I know you guys look at and your eyes gla glaze over until you need it, and then all of a sudden I'm a genius. Because I'll tell you right now, this information does not exist anywhere else but on this slide publicly, I think. Because I had to open up a ticket. And it was, it was a mess to get this information. And what I was looking for was enrollment um, active or concluded or deleted. And you can see those fields aren't sticky, and I thought they were. So I'd upload something, it'd get overwritten. I'd upload something, it'd get overwritten. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Uh, from my regular SIS uploads. I was trying to do something. Um, I was trying to adjust those enrollments, change students from deleted to concluded, and I, I could do that, and then they'd get overwritten by the SIS. I, I, there's a big backstory on that. that. Are you going to play with that? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I don't know if there's room for me to do that in the, the InstructureCon Canvas course, or my email address is bs at ucf.edu. Um, I will certainly provide this to anyone who wants it. Um, once you've uploaded it, uh, you can get the status. Um, this is one of those 249,000 file, uh, user files. Uh, it was at 1% and the workflow state is importing. Now this, I'll tell you, I, I had no idea this had happened. But um, it finished, it was at 100% workflow state, was imported with messages. Imported with messages means there was an error. Um, and this is the error. Out of 249,999 users, there was one stinking little error. And it was user has already claimed this other user's login information skipping. I have no idea what that means. Uh, it's on my list of things to go back and figure it out. But one out of a quarter of a million, I can take that and move on. Same username, too. Yeah, yeah, somebody, somebody has the same network ID. Um, and there's also a way that you can show all of the um, uh, batches you've uploaded through the API. Um, yeah. No, no. Uh, the question was, uh, 
does uh, Canvas keep the files uh, that you've uploaded? Uh, no, it doesn't. I, maybe it does keep them, but there's no way to get to them through the API. Um, APIs for transactions, I'm running short on time and I really want to get to some questions. I want, I want you guys to have a chance to tell me what you're doing because um, uh, users, you can do just about anything you need to do to a user. Sub-accounts, uh, you can list them, create them, edit them. Uh, same for groups. Terms, the only thing you can do with terms is, is look at them. You can't add them or create them or edit them. Um, get a single course. That's incredibly valuable. I use that all the time. If it returns a 404, that means the course doesn't exist. And a lot of times I'm working without SIS information, so I have no idea if the course exists or not, if it was requested by a faculty member. Um, so that one's very useful for me. Um, sections, you can do just about anything you want with a section. And this is a change. You can change a user from deleted to active. And if they're active, you can make them concluded. And if they're concluded, you can make them deleted. Um, or if they're active, you can go to deleted. But you cannot go from deleted directly to concluded. And I know that was different last semester because I wrote a program to do that and it did it. And then it broke and it stopped working. And I opened a ticket and they said, well, no, that's you just got to make them active first. And I'm like, no, no, I didn't do that before, and it worked. And they said, yes, yes. So I changed my program. I wasn't going to win that fight. So basically, you're going to end up doing a, basically a combination of things. There's no one way, right way to do it. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense. If, if you're doing cross-listing manually, you're going to do that once per term for a handful of courses, 40, 50 courses at most, and, and that's, that's, that's pretty doable. Uh, if you're at a smaller institution. Questions, comments? Quick yes, sir. So, cross listing, where, where do you control that? Do you allow your sources to control that, or do you? We allow through the SIS information, we, uh, we use PeopleSoft. We've got some pages built in there that will allow them to cross list any uh, courses that they're teaching and, and within so the same term. Yes. 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 Um, the question is, we, we keep the uh, do we keep the um, we we create a, a course and a section and then we, we cross list the section so there there is that that course hanging out there that has no section and will have no users and most likely no content but that's okay because it's a place for us to put it back if we have to de cross list it which happens yes sir. No, we do not use batch mode because that would overwrite any of the manual stuff we do. And, and as much as I'm telling you batch process or um, uploading things as batches is the way to go, just this morning from here on this very laptop, I enrolled manually 15 students into a class. There was just no way around it. I had to do it. So I copied their IDs into the text box and added them to a class. So yeah, we don't use, we don't use that batch process at all. We, um, mark them as deleted and run it that way. You're thinking, I can tell. Uh, am I out of time? Am I out of time? One more? Yeah. No, we do not. We don't do, um, we do uh, transactions for uh, university training for staff training, but on the academic side, we don't. I'd love to, but our um, PeopleSoft folks aren't ready to go there yet for everyone. If you liked it, tell them you saw me talking from the University of Central Florida. And if you didn't like it, tell people you saw some random Central Florida vacation pictures. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes, sir, one last question.
We pick the most recent. Um, the question is, uh, how, how do we handle changes in, um, in roles through our enrollment file? And we do pick the most recent uh, role that they've been assigned through the SIS information. And sometimes, sometimes it's a student who's been deleted, who's dropped the class and been deleted, but the instructor wants them back in for some reason. And we have a real hard time with that. We end up putting them back in as an observer uh, because our SIS file will drop them every night religiously because that's the way the registrar wants it. Questions, comments? Like I said, it's boring. I'm sorry, folks. I apologize. All right. I think we're done then. Thank you for bearing with me.